So we're calling this session the unfinished social revolution. Our next speaker is somebody who had a front row seat to the Egyptian revolution. She was covering what was happening in Tahrir Square last November. And to explain what happened then, Mona El Tahawi. Good morning, everyone. As, and as Manel said, happy Eid to those who do and don't celebrate because it's a happy time. So I don't go anywhere without my smartphone, not because I'm obsessed with my smartphone, but because Twitter saved my life. And today I'm going to tell you the story of how last year Twitter saved my life. But this year, Twitter, I almost gave up on Twitter. So what happened last year was I was on a train. I was on a night train from Tangier to Marrakesh, which sounds incredibly romantic. I was in Tangier to speak at a conference about the revolution. And clashes began very close to Tahrir Square. They began in Tahrir Square, but then they moved closer to the Interior Ministry on November the 19th. And all I could do was follow on Twitter what was happening, because I was reading in real time from friends on the ground in the clashes what was going on. Young men were losing their eyes. People were being shot and killed and dumped in the garbage. And all I could do was follow on Twitter. And that particular night when I was on a night train from Tangier to Marrakesh, I was in this tiny compartment with two bunk beds. And the three Moroccan women in the compartment with me had turned off the light because, of course, you go to sleep on a night train. And there I am on a top bunk, just following what's happening in Egypt and crying my eyes out. Because among the stories that I would hear was of this elderly man who found a young woman about my age, probably younger. And he goes up to her in the middle of the clashes and he said to her, what are you doing here? And she said, I'm here to defend the revolution against the military and the police. And he said to her, go back to Tahrir Square because you belong there, because you're educated. I can't read or write. I'm poor, nobody cares about me. When I die, Egypt needs you. So go back to Tahrir Square. And then I was also hearing stories and seeing pictures of boys as young as 12 years old who went to the clashes and took a Sharpie pen before they went in there, though, a, a black marker, and wrote their mother's phone number, phone number on their forearms because they knew they could die. And when they end up at the morgue, they want someone to call their mother because so many boys were taken in and nobody knew who they were. So I'm sitting there going, how the hell am I going to have a holiday in Marrakesh as this is happening? And I'm staying in this lovely Riyadh in Marrakesh, and all I can do is follow the news from Cairo and cry. And I was supposed to go to Brussels and speak at the European Parliament about, ironically enough, women in the revolution. But I wrote to them and I said, I'm sorry, I can't come. Cancel my ticket and my hotel reservation because I have to go back to Egypt. So I arrived on the 21st of November. And the next day, I met an activist friend of mine who said, do you want to come to Mohammed Mahmoud Street? And that's where the clashes were happening. And ironically, and very personally for me, Mohammed Mahmoud Street was the street that I would walk to every day to go to my university, the American University in Cairo. So me and this activist on Twitter, he's called Mag Butter. We couldn't get into the street because it was just so crowded and it was thick with tear gas. And there were all these guys zooming out. I would call them the motorbike angels because they would go into the street and they would literally carry out these young men who were just passed out from how thick the tear gas was and take them out into the field hospitals in Tahrir Square. But Magad and I managed to get through, and I'm tweeting this whole time because I want everybody to know what's happening. And the last thing I remember Magad telling me before we, we got to the front line of the clashes was, Mona, your life is more important than a tweet. Put your phone away, you're gonna die. So I put my phone away and we got to the front lines, and the front lines were basically um, these metal barriers, and there was a no man's land, and on the other side was the Egyptian police and the army shooting at us. So I stood on a rock and I started to take pictures with my smartphone, but then the shooting got too much. And these men around us, who we thought, we thought they were with us, we thought they were the revolution. They ended up being undercover security thugs who entrapped us in a shop until the riot police came. And the right police came, and I thought my friend had managed to escape, but they took him to a place where he could see me, and they beat him, and they beat me. And I was surrounded by about four or five policemen, I can't remember now how many, four or five right police who beat me with their nightsticks, and to protect my head, I put my arms like this, and they broke my left arm, and they broke my right hand. 
And as they were beating me, my phone, my smartphone fell to the ground, and I'm obsessed with this smartphone. And so after they beat me and they were dragging me towards the interior ministry, I actually said, stop, stop, I need to get my phone. <laughs> as if, you know, one of them would say, okay, boys, stop beating Mona right now because she needs her phone, and then we can take her. And it didn't stop, obviously. And in the no man's land that I mentioned between our front line and their front line, they sexually assaulted me. And I talk about this quite graphically because I think that we need to talk about this graphically because it's not my shame, it's theirs. I had hands all over my body. I had hands on my breasts. I had hands on my genitals. I was putting hands out of my trousers. And at one point, I fell. And I was eye level with their boots. And a voice inside me said, if you don't get up now, you're going to die. And I don't know how I got up, but I somehow got up. And then they dragged me to the interior ministry, and there's this small corridor. And I thought, surely someone's going to stop this, because they're still sexually assaulting me. But all the eyes that saw this were just dead. Until I they took me to their supervising officer, and he says to me, you're going to be safe now. I'm going to take care of you. And this is how he took care of me. He threatened me with gang rape. There was a group of riot police just going like this. Then he put me with my back to a, a, a gate and stood like this to protect me, but there were still all these hands coming at me until this older man from the military said, take her, in, take her out, and I thought, that's it, they're going to release me, it's over. But it was the beginning of 12 hours in detention, six hours with the interior ministry and six hours with military intelligence. And I spent the first three hours without my phone. My arm was beginning to look like the elephant man. My hand was hurting like hell. And I kept telling them I need medical attention, my arms are broken, and they would say, Put your fingers together, see they're not broken, you're fine. And then three hours into my detention in the interior ministry, two activists came to try to negotiate a truce. And one of them had a Blackberry. And I said, can you get me online? And by that time, they weren't paying so much attention to me. And he got me online, and I managed to send a tweet that said, beaten, arrested, interior ministry. And literally, 20 seconds later, his phone died. I don't know what would have happened to me if his phone, the battery was already dead. But I know, because I found out afterwards, that after that tweet went out, within 15 minutes, hashtag free Mona was trending globally. The Guardian and Al Jazeera covered what was happening to me. And the State Department tweeted back, we're on to this. This was the day before Thanksgiving. So a lot of people were off. Now, I was very lucky. I got that access to Twitter. People know who I am. I'm an Egyptian American. I have a US passport and the State Department actually tweeted me back. Where I was being held, human rights groups say that there are dungeons where Egyptian men, women, and children were being sexually tortured. So again, I was very lucky, because if I didn't have the media profile, if I didn't have the American passport, if I didn't have access to Twitter, if I didn't, if I didn't, if I didn't, I might not be alive today and here speaking to you. People quote Rumi, left, right, and center, and it's a cliche to, to quote Rumi, but what I learned that day, and in the days afterwards, and in the months since, is something that Rumi said that, that has personally been very true for me. And that is, the wound is where the light enters. And my wound, and don't worry, I'm not gonna take my clothes off here, I'm just gonna show you my wound. My wound is here, where I have a titanium plate with five screws, because I had an operation to repair this bone. But this is a scar that they put on me. I did not choose the scar. So what I chose instead, because I determined that when I heal, when, when my bones heal at least, emotional healing is another thing, that I would get a tattoo here. And this tattoo is the ancient Egyptian goddess Sekhmet. And I got her for many reasons. But remember those 12-year-old boys that I was reading about on the night train from Marrakesh, from Tangier to Marrakesh? They wrote their mother's phone number. This is like my mother, my ancient mother. And so this arm, I wanted to honor my Egyptian heritage. And on this arm, I will get Arabic calligraphy to honor the street where I was attacked and where so many other people were attacked and to write the, the Arabic word for freedom and one of the names of Egypt, Bahia. Because what I learned when I was beaten and in the days afterwards and in the months afterwards is that I remain an optimist. I'm incredibly optimistic about the revolution in Egypt. But I'm now an optimist with consequence because I know what it means to be a part of this revolution and to have suffered, but to have survived with my optimism intact. Because our optimism is our biggest and most potent weapon. If they take our optimism away, we have nothing. Because they, 
and they are the regime that is still very much there, and the current president, who as far as I'm concerned, and many people are concerned, does not represent all of Egypt, and this unfinished revolution, the unfinished social and political revolution, needs us to remain optimistic. And I know because I go to Egypt every month, ever since I was attacked, I've been going back every month because I wanted them to know, you will not scare me from my country of birth because this is my revolution along with everybody else's. I know that there are millions of Egyptians working very bravely to make this revolution succeed. And one of the, one of the things I wanna do when I move back to Egypt, because I'm moving back to Egypt, probably in December, and it's been postponed a bit, and I'll tell you why in a, in, in a minute. One of the things I wanna do is launch a national campaign against sexual violence to use my story and to use the story of other women who have spoken out against what happened to them. To offer free le legal aid for those who want it, free self-defense classes for those who want it, and free post-traumatic stress disorder, because we don't have that as a discipline in Egypt. But also to get football players to make these huge billboards that say, real men don't rape, real men don't beat. And also to change the protocol when women go into hospitals, because this is the social revolution. We've removed Mubarak from the presidential palace, but there's still a Mubarak in our head, there's still a Mubarak in our bedroom, and there's still a Mubarak on the street, and that is the culture and society that is incredibly misogynistic against women. And without that social revolution that involves the sexual revolution and the cultural revolution, the political revolution will fail. And one of the things I learned when you go to an ER room with two broken arms and surviving a sexual assault is that the female nurse will ask you, how could you have let them do that to you? And so I replied, when you're surrounded by four or five riot police and they're holding sticks this big, there's no such thing as fighting back and your arms are broken. So I'm talking with doctors about how they can change the protocol and make doctors and nurses in ER rooms more sensitive to women who have survived sexual assault. I would also like to work with the Interior Ministry, although I have a deep, deep hatred for the Interior Ministry, but we need female police units at police stations in Egypt so that women can go and report sexual assault and sexual violence, because right now most women would rather not, because they'll be sexually assaulted all over again. I would like to talk to the ultras, who are these amazing football fans. Often you hear them being referred to as football hooligans, they're not. They protected the revolution because they've been fighting against the Egyptian police since 2007. They know how to wear them out and they wore them out. And they protected Tahrir and other sensitive points of the revolution. And I'm talking to them about how to get the word out about this campaign to their young members because we need to work with men and women in Egypt for this social revolution to succeed. Now, I mentioned that I'm postponing my, my return to Egypt because I was supposed to return back in November, but three and a half weeks ago in New York, I was arrested. So I joke that I was, I've been arrested in my two favorite cities, Cairo and New York, but for very different reasons. In Cairo, I told you what happened. I was in these clashes and I was covering them. But in New York, and this is where I hit the wall with Twitter, because Twitter saved my life in Cairo last year. But a few weeks ago, we heard in New York that these ads were going to go up in the New York subway funded by a notorious racist and bigot called Pamela Geller. And we, the Muslim community of New York City, are very familiar with her because of her history of racism and bigotry. So the ads were going to say this. In the war between the civilized man and the savage, always choose the civilized man, support Israel, defeat jihad. I read about these ads and I went nuts. And people on Twitter began this campaign, hashtag my subway ads. Now, Twitter sometimes works. When Newsweek had a cover story called Muslim Rage about the reaction to that film that had been pulled from YouTube, Newsweek wanted to start a campaign on Twitter, hashtag Muslim Rage, so that people could talk about Muslim Rage, how angry us Muslims are. And Muslims on Twitter subverted that, that campaign and used the hashtag Muslim Rage against Newsweek by posting tweets like this. I've lost my son at the airport, but I can't call his name out. He's called Jihad. Hashtag Muslim rage. <laughs> I'm having a really great hair day, but you can't see it because I'm wearing a headscarf. Hashtag Muslim rage. So that was very clever. But when it came to these ads, 10 of which were in IRL, in real life, you can't do this Twitter thing. And so on this hashtag my subway ad, people were posting things like, if I had a subway ad, it would be what my eight-year-old says. And he just drew a picture that said, what makes the flowers grow? Allah makes the flowers grow. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? This is New York. You can't say this in New York. You're going to die. You have to get out there and confront these ads. And so how I chose to confront those ads was to go and buy a can of pink spray paint, 
because my nieces love pink, but for me, pink is about protest and not princesses. And pink is the least violent color there is, and I didn't want my protest to be about violence. And pink matched the raincoat I was wearing that day. And a few hours before my protest, I was on another subway station being interviewed by someone because the media had already gone and stationed themselves by different ads. And we heard this ripping sound. And this very New York kind of guy, very Wall Street, in a suit, was literally ripping this ad off. So the, the, the journalist went up to him and asked him, so why are you doing that? And he goes, this is fucking New York City. This is unacceptable. And I was like, who are you? I love you. I didn't want to rip the ad off, though. Because if I'm fighting for a social revolution in Egypt that's about freedom of all kind, sexual freedom, cultural freedom, and media freedom, the last thing I want to do is shut down someone else's freedom of expression, even if it's hate speech. Because in the United States, unlike Europe, hate speech is protected speech. But the point I wanted to make, and this is a social revolution now in the US, because we wear different hats. Those of us who are lucky enough to move between different cultures, we have to understand how to use those hats effectively for the various social revolutions that we fight for. And the hat I wear in the United States and that I've been wearing for the past 12 years, I moved there a year before 9-11, is the hat of the Muslim. In Egypt, I never identify as Muslim. In Egypt, I'm secular and I want to separate politics from religion. In the US, I want to identify and I very much identify as Muslim because I want this. As well as the way Manal looks, as well as the way that my sister-in-law looks and my sister and my mother, I want this to also be identified as Muslim. That's my so social revolution. And so, I want the First Amendment to be left untouched. But if that's protected political speech, if hate speech is protected, then what can I do to protest that, to make racism and bigotry socially unacceptable? Because that's what I wanted to do. Now, the United States has a long and proud history of civil disobedience. What was it, if not civil disobedience, when four young black men went to a lunch counter in Greensboro, North Carolina, and sat down a whites-only lunch counter and said, we want to eat? and they were told it's illegal, you have to leave, and they were arrested. Nonviolent civil disobedience has a long and proud history. What Manal did was nonviolent civil disobedience. And that's what I wanted to do because I believe in the right to offend, but I also believe in the right to protest that offense. And so I went with my pink spray can, fully intending to spray, can, to spray paint the word racist, but I'm no graffiti artist. And as soon as I pressed that, the button of the spray can, I thought, wow, this is so hard. <laughs> all I ended up doing was just kind of spraying blobs on the poster. And I've since got all these tweets from various graffiti artists saying, you need tagging lessons. And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> but there was media there already, and there was someone from the group who funded the ad there already, and they filmed what I did. And this woman from the, from the group that funded the ad literally threw herself between me and the, and the ad. And at one point I said, woman, are you using your body to defend hate? I sprayed around her because I did not want assault charges, but I was arrested. And I'm very proud I was arrested, and I would do it again in a second. Because what I, what I learned in the 22 hours that I was detained in police custody in New York, I spent overnight at Central Booking, otherwise known as the Tombs, is that for a lot of people, especially on the left in the US, they've totally forgotten the social revolution that has given us the luxury and privilege to not have to protest in the US in the way that we're protesting in Egypt because earlier generations protested and created this luxury to be snarky on Twitter. People think now that activism is being snarky on Twitter. They've been rendered spineless by snarkiness. But when hate and racism and bigotry is there face to face with you in the New York subway that millions of people ride, you have to leave Twitter and you have to go meet it in real life. Just like we met it in real life in Cairo. So in Cairo, Twitter saved my life, but in New York, and it got me out of detention. But in New York, I hit that wall with Twitter because people just wanted to go and fight this, this hate online. Who is gonna see it? It's this tiny room. Who is gonna see it except you and your fellow snarky friends? And what I also learned spending the night at Central Booking, and I looked around, I don't know if any of you have spent the night at Central Booking in New York, but you look around you in the holding cell and you think, my God, we're all brown and black people. And that's the social revolution in the US. I've never been jailed in the US before, but you look around and the jail system is full of brown and black people. What's going on, America? That is the social revolution. Because to afford the snarkiness that mostly whites on Twitter have, 
You forget the social revolution, but for a lot of us brown and black people in America, the social revolution is not over. I live on a street that is the cross street. It's 127th Street, but it's very close to Malcolm X Boulevard. And you all remember Malcolm X by any means necessary. So I have a history in the US when I talk about the social revolution of doc Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his nonviolent non violent protest, excuse me. But there's also Malcolm X by any means necessary. And you have a whole spectrum of activism available to you. And so when I move back, with back and forth between Egypt and the US, I try to take those lessons that I learn in one country to another. So when I speak on US campuses about the social revolution, I tell all these young Americans, you have to remember your country's history and what gave you this luxury to go and spend the whole day on Twitter and do nothing outside of Twitter. Because when I go to Egypt, people are dying and their bodies are being dumped in the garbage. And in, in Egypt today, various feminist groups have helped to put a hotline up so that women can call if they're sexually assaulted during the holidays. I'll be working with a feminist group on the ground that travels across the country to give women identification papers because some girls and women are prevented from having IDs without which you don't exist because the men worry that they will use them to divorce them. That kind of mobility that Manel spoke about. So there are many social revolutions out there and a lot of the speakers at this conference have talked tangentially about social revolutions. But what I always talk about either in Egypt or in the US is find the place where you have the most impact and that's often the place where you are a minority. And use that minority status to push, to push and to touch the places that hurt. But as angry as I am, you also need something that sustains you. And I always tell people there are three things that sustain me, and that is dancing and fighting and loving. And I say dance at least once a week, fall in love at least once a month, and always fight. But also, and I'm gonna end here now, poetry also sustains me. And this poem especially is for all you budding revolutionaries out there. Pablo Neruda, who was very politically active, but also incredibly sensual in his poetry. And I love his combination of politics and poetry. And this poem is dedicated to all the revolutionaries that I love at least once a month. It's called The Flag. Stand up with me. No one would like more than I to stay on the pillow where your eyelids try to shut out the world for me. There too, I would like to let my blood sleep surrounding your sweetness. But stand up, you, stand up. But stand up with me and let us go off together to fight face to face against the devil's webs, against the system that distributes hunger, against organized misery. Let's go and you, my star next to me, newborn from my own clay, you will have found the hidden spring and in the midst of the fire, you will be next to me with your wild eyes raising my flag. Thank you. <laughs>